Well, good morning, shipmates. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, and Mr. Walden, thank you for that introduction. It, it's true, uh, Stratton is the newest vessel, but you know, there's some similarities between, and I'm gonna say Taney, because I was raised for four decades saying Taney, and I understand there's a dispute with the family, whether it's Tawny or Taney, but I'm used to saying Taney, so I'll say that. Uh, these ships, Taney and her sister ships, were all built, seven of them, as the country was coming out of the Great Depression. They were built for an uncertain future, and then they served the country, some of them over 50 years. I had the great privilege just this past year in visiting the two remaining, Ingham down in Key West and Taney here. Uh, so this is a real privilege for me. And uh, I don't know, Mr. Talbot, after you and the others that have spoken this morning, there are a few times that I feel really inadequate to speak, but uh, to have heroes like you to be able to speak to us today, what a privilege it is. I was here in two, uh, 2007 to speak at this same event, a very cold day that day. People were wrapped up in blankets in the, in the front row. And uh, the crowd was about half this size. So it's good to see that the crowd has grown. But then again, our, v our uh, Pearl Harbor veterans have diminished. So sir, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming out today. And uh, we hope we see you for many more of these events here in the future. Uh, I also listened with great interest to Mr. Kitchen and his narrative about his shipmates and all the anecdotes. I love anecdotes like that. Equipment returned to the ship. <laughs> Aggravation of officers. Producing alcohol on board. All violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. But I think as Commandant, I have the authority to say that uh, all those offenses have been mitigated by honorable service over the years to our country, and I do declare them null and void, <laughs> including any future stories that may come to light. I'd like to thank everybody that's responsible for this ceremony today and for Taney's appearance. You know, for a sailor to come down to either Ingham or Taney brings back an awful lot of memories. Uh, you just have to go down below decks. I know it was the same on the Ingham. It's here. That smell comes back to you in a minute. A ship, the ship never loses it. Uh, and coming down to the pier this morning, you get that smell of the brackish water of the harbor. Uh, oftentimes, when you come down to the ships, you smell the coffee that's still brewing. You can still smell the smells of bacon and eggs from the morning. Uh, the engines are warming up, the smell of diesel in the air, and you know it's time to get underway again, to take in the lines and then uh, head out into the harbor and start going out to sea, and the air becomes fresher and cleaner, and you go out to see God's great creations firsthand. So there's no apologies for the weather today because as sailors, we know you can never control the weather. You just adapt to the weather. And uh, this is not such a bad day for a sailor. In fact, for sailors, it's good to be reminded what it's like to be cold and wet and tired and carrying out a good mission. So this is, I think, a perfect day for people to celebrate Taney and our heroes and our veterans who served during World War II and at Pearl Harbor. We're especially pleased today to welcome Lord Ambrose Greenway joining us, the chairman of the World Ship Trust, an organization dedicated to the recognition of and support for historic vessels like the Cutter Taney. I'm very familiar with the Historic Ship Foundation as a proud member of the National Maritime Historical Association, so it's good to see fellow members, including President Emeritus Peter Stanford in the crowd here this morning. Thanks for coming down. Second, I want to thank all today's ceremony participants. We're honored to have representation from so many services, including the Marine Corps Color Guard, of course, uh, Chief Warrant Officer 5 Fred Schinberg, uh, who did the uh, POWMIA flag. Uh, I heard there was going to be a Navy band. I haven't seen one. <laughs> Is it here? Okay, the Navy band. And uh, of course, we have the Coast Guard Honor Guard that's going to take part. I saw a lot of Army uh, photographers running around. I think we must have every photographer in the United States Army here today, it looks like. Uh, the only thing I haven't seen is Air Force. Do we have any Air Force here today? Well, you know, they were created after World War II anyway, so.
Next, I want to thank our many program participants who uh, oftentimes get skipped over. Our national anthem singer, Mr. Joseph DeCara, and I understand he'll sing a little bit later on as well. Uh, Mr. Brian Auer, who uh, will sing Amazing Grace, and of course our chaplain, Lieutenant Jason Olvin, thank you for being here. And for those of you who don't know, the Chaplain Corps just celebrated last month their 236th anniversary of the Chaplain Corps. So it's great to be here on Taney, and I listened with interest to Mr. Walden, who gave sort of the grand strategy, the grand overview of World War II and how Pearl Harbor played into the war. Uh, but I also, as I said, I like Mr. Kitchen's stories because I always like the stories behind the story, the individuals. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Taney in World War II and Pearl Harbor, but then I'm going to break it down into an individual story which ties Taney to current day events. So what we're here today to do is observe the manners of our profession. I speak a lot about this to our Coast Guard members. These manners are not recorded in any book or any document or any publication. These manners are observed, they're taught, and they're experienced, and they're felt in the heart. By practicing them, we prepare other generations to carry on our traditions. That's why I'm so happy to see the veterans up forward, but also the young people that have joined us today, because just like my grandfather taught me the manners of respecting our country, it's great to get young people involved so they learn about this as well. So 70 years ago today at 0755 on December 7th, 1941, members of Taney's crew were resting in their racks right below the very deck that were assembled on when they were blasted out of their holiday routine by an attack force of over 180 Japanese aircraft. Now, I took the opportunity the other day to review the report of Taney's commanding officer about the events of that morning. Commander Lewis B. Olson reported as follows, and I quote, when the anti-aircraft fire was first observed, general quarters were sounded, and all officers not on board were ordered to return. The anti-aircraft battery, as well as other guns, were ready to fire with their full crew and three officers at their stations in four minutes. The remaining officers, with one exception, were aboard less than 10 minutes later. Steam was ordered up and the vessel was ready to get underway. Without even receiving any orders from any source, between 9.15 and 9.18, Taney's gun crews opened fire on scattering formations of enemy aircraft at high altitude, passing over the harbor from west to east using number four and number five three-inch guns. Commander Olson goes on to describe several more volleys of fire put up by Taney's crew. Though most of the aircraft were out of range, Taney's gunfire is credited with saving the Honolulu power plant from destruction. He concludes that, quote, the officers and crew bore themselves well, although most members of the crew had no training except for drills and had never seen anything above a 50 caliber fired, end quote. That quickly changed as Taney headed for sea the following morning to chase enemy submarines and on to an illustrious wartime career where she earned four battle stars for service both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. But after reading Admiral Olson's report, Going back to those in stories of individuals, I wondered, who was that one missing officer? <laughs> well, the one exception, as the CO referred to it, whatever became of him? Well, as some of you know from being aboard this ship, Taney was designed to carry an aircraft, a Grumman JF-2 Duck. Well, that aircraft and its pilot had been assigned on December 6th to Naval Air Station Pearl Harbor. The pilot, and some of you will recognize his name, was Lieutenant Frank Erickson. Leave it to the aviator to be AWOL. <laughs> so when Lieutenant Erickson reported to the Naval Air Station on that Saturday morning, the Navy officers were so pleased to have a Coast Guard officer in their midst that they stuck him with duty that evening. No qualification required, just that he was the Coastie, you got duty. So early on the morning of December 7th, 1941, Lieutenant Erickson was pre preparing to oversee morning colors when the base was suddenly rocked by two heavy explosions. The Marine color detail, and it's appropriate we have a Marine color guard here this morning, the Marine color detail didn't even hesitate, but they also didn't wait till 0800. They hoisted the colors. The flag went up, but the tune was general quarters. 
Lieutenant Erickson then looked up just in time to see a torpedo bomber launch its weapon at the USS California. As the explosions continued, the phone rang. At the, end other, at the other end of the line was the air station commanding officer, U.S. Navy Captain James Shoemaker, demanding to know what in the heck kind of drills is that Coast Guard officer pulling out down there. So with the shrapnel still raining down, the message was soon dispatched from the air station duty officer, Air Raid, Pearl Harbor, this is not a drill. Lieutenant Erickson then took station at the airport control tower. He had a commanding view of the attack. From his position, he observed oil-covered men who had abandoned their bombed-out ships, struggling to make their way ashore in Pearl Harbor's burning waters. The image was indelibly seared in his memory, and from this chaos, a vision was formed. The vision Lieutenant Erickson had was an aircraft capable of hovering hoisting and ferrying survivors to safety. And at that moment, his passion was cemented. His mission was clear. He was, he's, his calling was to bring that vision to reality, and that's just what he did. Working with Sikorsky Aviation, he pioneered the use of helicopters for search and rescue. He'd go on to become designated as Coast Guard Helicopter Pilot Number One, and his vision of helicopters would go on to serve countless lives, or save countless lives, on the sea and on the ground. His Pearl Harbor experience, like that of so many World War II veterans, spurred him on to pioneer a craft that would save countless lives. So now you know the rest of the story about one individual from the Cutter Taney, that one exception, that missing officer, who went on to become an exceptional officer and dedicated his talents, so that the rescue swimmer creed says, so that others might live. On a lighter note, after Captain Erickson retired, he told the story later in life and he joked that Coast Guard aviators that followed him should be thankful because he was not aware of another Coastie ever being put in charge of a Navy air station. <laughs> and he would end the story with a flourish by saying, and that's how I started World War II. <laughs> it's particularly fitting that we reflect upon Captain Erickson's legacy today because not only are we celebrating the 70th commemoration of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but all year long we've been celebrating the centennial of naval aviation. And I think a case can be made that if naval aviation wasn't started 30 years before World War II, that war might have gone differently for us because certainly it played a huge part for us. And also you notice that I started off by greeting you all as shipmates. For me, shipmate has always been a term of endearment. I use the term not only to refer to people I've served with, past and present, but also to the extended members of our Coast Guard family and the greater military family and supporters who are all with us today. Being aboard the Cutter Taney on this historic occasion and the use of the word shipmate is particularly important and appropriate because to me, this ceremony is really about her shipmates and many other members of the greatest generation. The lessons that generation have taught us, that many of you in the audience have shown us, and that our younger generations must learn and pass on, is that success in World War II at the beginning was not a given, nor is it in any challenging endeavor or conflict. Rather, success was earned and is earned because of our shipmates' willingness to serve and sacrifice in pursuit of a common cause. A similar ceremony to ours is being held 5,800 miles away from where we've assembled, and though I suspect it's a bit warmer there, the crowd looks out on the USS Arizona Memorial in Pearl Harbor. The manners of our profession are being observed there as well. And the same lesson is being passed on, that is the character of our shipmates that keeps the torch of freedom burning brightly. We resolve to never forget the sacrifices and those of our military service members and their families, past and present, that continue to serve in harm's way. So, while I might be a little bit biased today, I'll speak for all members of the military and all veterans, but I will say that we are Coast Guardsmen. We work as a crew. We serve as a family. This is our way. This is who we are. And this is what we do. Semper Paratus, and thank you.